episode 59. How does nobody know about this? And why aren't they on the covers of magazines and on the front pages of newspapers? Why aren't they there? Why aren't we just like, you know, singing their praises? And so that was, you know, part of my original goal. This episode is sponsored by Touch Bistro. Hey, everybody, this is the Just Forking Around podcast, where every week we raise our glass and toast to the beautifully insane sexy world of food adventures. Expect a variety pack of guests every week. All have the most compelling stories. They are the brewers, the distillers, the authors, winemakers, farmers, vegan product makers, restaurateurs, top chefs, entrepreneurs. I mean, truly inspirational, motivational. This is ear ball riveting. So settle in and let's fork around. Forking around reminds me of my social media platforms that I would love to share with you. (laughs) At Forking Podcast, that is Instagram. So at Forking Podcast, website, justforkingaround.net. And Facebook is my personal page, Debbie.Salzberg. And if you're on the iTunes, enjoying the podcast, I would love if you enjoyed the show to subscribe, rate, and review. Much love. And now let's really get into this next episode. Episode 59, showcasing Audra Mulkern. Okay, I don't want to give away too much. So I'm going to just explain what her project is. And then we'll get right into that episode. So Audra, she really wants to change the way we look at farming and the food that's on our plate. As a photographer and a writer, she's, she's really sought to shine a spotlight on all the hardworking people who are growing a food system that is sustainable and equitable for all. She is the founder of the Female Farmer Project. The Female Farmer Project. It is a multi-platform documentary project and it chronicles the rise of women working in agriculture around the world. I mean, huge. From in-depth stories, there's some personal essays, photographic portraits. She has a podcast and the documentary film, which I am so excited for this to come to fruition. She's been working so hard. The, this, I mean, this project really gives a powerful voice to the fastest growing demographic in agriculture the female farmer. I find her to be so passionate. Story is so compelling. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Audra Mulkern. Audra Mulkern, are you ready to fork around? I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's just get right into it and do a toast and then we'll just, we'll go right into because we have so much meat so to speak, to talk about with with what you're involved with. So I'm so happy that we finally connected for the podcast. So thank you so much, Audra, because you're a busy, busy woman, to say (laughs) the least. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored by it. Usually I drink, I know, don't be shocked, rosé when I do recordings because I'm on the boat and it kind of sets the mood. But today I just have a water. It's a smart water. So I'm going to raise my smart water to you. And I'm going to raise my mason jar that is covered in a leather... I guess kushi, but it's leather. So I can drink coffee out of my mason jar. And it's uh, hand stamped by a female farmer out of, I think, Kansas. And it says grit and grace. So it is my reminder to have both. And I'm drinking kombucha. Oh, nice. Let's do a toast. I'm going to have you do the honors, Audra. Uh, I'd like to toast to the invisible people in the food system. The farmers, the farm workers, the truckers, the people behind the scenes in restaurants, to them. Here, here. I'm cheers to that. I love that. That was beautiful. Thank you. Let's take a look at your quote bio, like your resume, so to speak. So what what would we see on that one pager? Well, out of school, I worked for the airline industry. That was in Los Angeles, actually. I'm from Los Angeles. And I worked for the airlines at LAX. And my husband had um, applied for a job and got it. And the job was with this small little company here in Seattle area that was 
developing a product called Windows. Yeah. <laughs> like Windows. <laughs> that definitely just got a chuckle. <laughs> that <right>? is. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a leap of faith and we um, moved up here and I worked for the airline at the airport here at SeaTac for a while. And he started developing a career at Microsoft. And I eventually left and joined him at Microsoft. I had a very, very specific objective when I went to Microsoft. I wanted to learn the company from the beginning, kind of like that mailroom kind of, you know, learn the yeah, company from the inside out. Totally. And so I applied for a receptionist job and I got it and went from the receptionist desk to the office of the president and worked um, side by side with the business development team in the office of the president. Wow, that's so awesome. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big leap. Yeah, it was a it was a lot of fun. It was a, you know these were the good times at Microsoft when all of these products were coming out and you know we were um, celebrating practically every week for, with our releases. And I stayed there, shipped a lot of products, and left in '99 when my first child was born. Because I had this baby, I wanted I mean, my focus turned to. You know, how was I going to feed my child? Because I certainly couldn't feed her the way I had been eating at Microsoft. Mm. So I needed to learn how to cook. I needed to learn about food. I needed to learn about vegetables. And I lived in a small farming community just outside of Seattle, real close to Microsoft. And I could see the farmers out there in the fields, but I didn't know how to get to them or to their food. What do you mean by that? Like you saw them farming, but you didn't know how how to get that on your table? Right. There was... No local food scene. Wow. This is in 99. There yeah. was no website, right? right Farmers right, didn't right. have websites. They didn't have Facebook. Right. You know, this stuff didn't exist. Like it was really hard to access that. Yeah. Like if I didn't know the name of the farm, how would I call them? How would I look them up in the phone book? Because that's what we had access to was phone books. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Like 10 years ago. Even longer, longer right? That's right. 12, but even within ago. 10, right? Yeah. 20, sorry. That, that <laughs> but I was thinking... I was 18. 18, yeah. 18. <laughs> but then I was thinking even 10. Sorry, I was going back. Like even. Yeah, even 10 years ago, it was hard. It, it, it took a lot of persistence on my part to track down those farmers. And I became a member of a CSA, which is pretty ubiquitous now. That's Community Supported Agriculture, where I paid up front at the beginning of the season for my whole season's worth of vegetables. But I had to drive all the way into Seattle and pick it up at Pike Place Market, which meant I had to drive past the farms that were producing these vegetables to pick them up in Seattle and then drive back through the farms. And, you know, I, I saw the, the, you know, the folly in that. And eventually one of the local farms started a CSA of their own and they eventually became the largest CSA in the country. And many of the farms in this community end up being sort of the, you know, pioneers in that kind of marketing directly to consumers. They weren't the first, but they a lot of them were the largest and doing much much of that kind of interesting marketing. And so I was a CSA member, I want to say probably in the year 2000. So I was really an early adopter in that space. That's not as common. Right. Wow, that's awesome. So, but the beauty of um, being a part of that CSA is that every week on the fresh sheet, it told you where the vegetables came from. So, you know, the squash came from such and such farm. And so then I was able to start looking for them on my own. And that was the beginning. But it wasn't until farmers markets opened here in my community that I really started to develop those relationships with the farmers themselves because then I could meet them on a weekly basis or you know twice a week. And at one point I decided that I wasn't going to grow any vegetables in my garden. I was going to buy everything from my local farmers because they can do it better and more efficiently and with less water than I can. Mm. So I spent the whole season exploring vegetables at the farmer's market instead of a CSA. So I didn't do CSA and I didn't grow vegetables. I just did farmer's markets. And I started taking pictures with my phone. And that was the year of the iPhone 3GS. So okay, yeah. That, that's dating me <laughs> as well. And I started taking pictures. And at the end of the season, I realized that I had documented a whole season. Oh. And so I did a little tiny book and 
the intention was that it was just for my community so that we could celebrate our farmers and the bounty that they brought to market. And it was peppered with essays from the farmers themselves. And it was just this really little sweet gem of a book. And I think the first evening I sold like 50 copies and I was like, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. That's like, I did not expect that. I, I started to see that there was a hunger for that connection between consumers and, and producers. Just like I was hunger, hungry for it, as were other people. I think it was the next summer, I was spending a lot of time kind of thinking about what will I do next? You know, what can I photograph next? Yeah. What, what story can I tell? And I was sitting there and I was watching all of the interns sort of kind of, you know, the vegetable farmer intern would take a, a bunch of vegetables over to the bread guy and trade vegetables with, you know, this baker. And then, you know, the meat farmer, she would trade for something else. And I could see all these interns moving around doing all this trading when I realized that behind every single farm table was a woman. And it was just like a light bulb went on yeah. because I realized that I had noticed something and why had I noticed it? What had I bought into that made me think that this was something special or different? Why did I think women farming was different? So I had to ask myself those questions and, and start doing some research. And so I literally went to the library and started trying to find any books about women in agriculture and dig deeper. And the more I dug, the more I came up empty. Women just weren't in the visual narrative. They just weren't in that, you know, what I call the agricultural canon. You know, you can look back through history and over and over, it's men at the forefront. Even though we know that women were the first farmers, you know, they were the native women were the ones who were cultivating and breeding the crops when people arrived on the shores Great. and taught those people how to farm. Wow. So throughout history, women you know, took over in times of crisis and farmed and did it better and were more efficient and made more money when women were in charge. It was just this yeah. interesting thing that, but yet we think of farming as men's work. So I um, decided I was going to do something about that. <laughs> but exactly what, because I had been taking pictures only with my iPhone and I didn't know how to use a camera. So I asked a girlfriend of mine who's a wedding photographer if I could borrow her camera which is a big ask in itself. And could she also teach me how to use it? So she, she agreed. She believed in my vision of capturing women working on the farm and uh, brought over her camera, gave me a 15 minute lesson. Like a real I camera, looked, like a real, like you yeah, have to focus like, it and stuff. No, yeah, like, she, like with the lens. Oh, there was a, you know, apparently all of these cameras have an automatic mode, but she never told me that. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't find that out till much, much later. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> like, that's... Well, she, I, it was manual mode. I had to learn how to, oh you know, put it in focus. And oh, there was, you know, it was, yeah. it was like doing math in my head. So Audra, was this in eight years ago? Around? No, there was, well, this was, let's see, the little book that I was telling you about was in 2011. Okay. So it was really May 2012. So okay. it will be May yeah, 2018 coming, coming up here. Yep. will be five years. Okay. So happy anniversary, almost five years. I knew it was coming. I knew something was in May. I, I didn't know if it was like yes. a, yeah, five or six. Yeah. So, awesome. Okay. Cool. So in so, May. So now we're... Yeah. Okay. May, I, you know, I started asking my girlfriends who, you know, these Farmers are my neighbors. That's what another thing that shocked me is like, why did I not notice this? I mean, these are these are women that I have dinner with on a regular basis. We get together and have potlucks. And why did I why did I think men were farmers? You know, necessarily. So I started calling them up and asking them if I could come over and take pictures of them farming. They, <laughs> they yeah. kind of thought I was crazy. They're like, What? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do what? You know, yeah. like so I would show up and they, you know, in May it was greenhouse work. So I just started taking as many pictures as I could. You know, I would like take 800 pictures over the course of like a couple of hours and like 10 would be in focus. <laughs> I just, and I just kept at it and kept at it until my, my ratio got better. <laughs> I, Cause I look at those pictures and I think they're, I mean, they, they're amazing. Like when I look at them, I've, 
I think that you're a graduate of, you know, photography school. I mean, those are really, <laughs> because I know it has to do with the lighting and the shutter speed. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I don't it. even know all what all those things mean. I'm the least technical <laughs> photographer you've ever met. Yeah, but those People. pictures are amazing. You capture the energy and the spirit. You definitely did. Well, that's what I hope that you know, maybe just like steering away from understanding the technical part of it and just taking pictures that I like mm. as, you know, and yeah. pictures that I, what, you know, I want people to see what I see, which is the beauty. It's what I want people to see is the grace yeah. and the grit. Sort of like my, you know, yeah, you're, like my glass. Yeah, yeah, the grit and grace of what these women are doing. Uh, it's beautiful to me. Yeah. It's cool. It's different. But it's old. It's not new. On your, was it your website or one of your blogs, there was something you were noting about how in history, like when we look at all the pictures of farming, it's all the, all the men. And also you were saying how there weren't on any of the deeds or any of the, you know, ownership of right. the, the land. And that there were some crazy percentage numbers. It was something like less than... 0.5, like less than 1%. Yeah, less than 1% in occupying history. You know, and that's, you know not just agriculture, that's all together. Right. Like everything women have done is not represented in history. We do not occupy history. Right. We have literally been written out of history. And so when I look at that and I look at, you know, the role of these brilliant, tenacious women who literally fed us in times of crisis and they are getting no recognition at all. And I think that's really what inspired me in the very beginning is that the modern day women were not getting any recognition. Mm. You know, yeah. I would meet farmers that, you know, they would make sure that the local nursery or daycare centers that, you know, in that were perhaps in underserved communities, they would make sure that they had fresh vegetables every week for those kids. So those kids were getting that nutritious those nutritious vegetables and and whatever milk or whatever, they were doing that, but without telling anybody about it. They just no. did it, yeah. you know. Or they would, they were very prone to be the types that would have people come out and glean their fields for the food bank, so that there was fresh produce. Maybe it was ugly, but it was still fresh produce for the market. I mean, for the the food bank. You know, they were doing all these things, and I was like. How does nobody know yeah, about this? That's, yeah. And why aren't they on the covers of magazines and right. on the front pages of newspapers? Why aren't they there? Why aren't we just like, you know, singing their praises? Why are they going unnoticed? And so that was, you know, part of my original goal for the modern day farmer today of, you know, these women who are doing amazing things and I want them to be. And now they are. Like I I, I did it. Like I got them on the covers of magazines. I can't believe it some days. Like, you know, they're on the front pages of newspapers. Their their stories are being told. And along the way, I've been able to build a platform for their voices that, you know, they can be amplified. So just, so when we're, when we're looking at what, the, what we're speaking about right now, it's, there's, the photography, the books and the stories you're telling. And also, I mean, there's so many other parts too that you've been pushing some, some things through, um, I don't want to say Congress, but, you know, political. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's that. But the Female Farmer Project. So the Female Farmer Project is, it encompasses all of it. So this is the macro. So this is your, so I'm right. just so people who, who understand, because I'm so passionate about the documentary and, you know, the Female Farmer Project and everything you're doing, which is more of like the macro. And then underneath, we have all these um, great avenues and kind of things that you've been involved with that have pivoted to other arenas. So yeah. the biggest thing is your your why. This is how it started. It's like you kind of like we're at Microsoft and then you you have your your daughter and then you start looking around at these farms and you're like, how can I get that food on my table? And that that right. was a that adventure, that looking, that journey is what brought you to this point that we're at now, right? You're, it's kind of this yeah. whole part of your journey and what you've learned. And one of the things I find to be super compelling is that when you start, I think we're going to get to that, but when you start showcasing the, the present day of women's work in the fields and in their farms and the modern, there's a point you say, well, you have to go back to look at the history of. And I right. think that's so, it's so important because when there's no media coverage or no, like you were saying about pictures of women or, you know, on any um, accolades. It's almost like the world, we don't note that the possibilities 
because we just assume, right, that it's like a dude's, a guy's, a man's world, or a man, I mean, a man's work, or for the farms. So what I think is so so cool with what you've started to do is not just raise the awareness, but you're you've assisted in showcasing the women so that it becomes okay, like for young people to be like, oh, farmers, there are women, but without maybe pressing the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot, oftentimes you don't know it can be done unless you've seen it been done. Yeah, you exactly. know, that if you can't imagine it on your own and that sometimes that little visual assist. I mean, that's, I mean, I, and it, it was so rewarding when women would come up to me and they say, oh, I started farming because of the Female Farmer Project. Thank you. So you know, cool. I didn't, I didn't even imagine that for myself until I saw all these women farming and realized that's what I wanted to do. So yeah, there is that, there is that visual component of it. And, you know, anytime you do anything like this, you, you know, there's like, okay, so women are farming. So what? And, you know, I have to ask myself that like, so what? Why, you know, so what if women are farming? But women have a, a harder time accessing the same things that men do. I think that's true for a lot of industries and it's especially true for agriculture. They just really struggle accessing the really important things like land and financing and education. Yeah. Because for so long, farming has just been passed down from generation to generation. And now we're talking about women who are doing it as an encore career. Or maybe it's their first career, but they're first generation. So how do they access the kind of resources? And really, they have to be significant because land is not cheap. If you want to farm near a metropolitan center where your customers are, you have to access that land, you have to access that financing, you have to access those training resources. I mean, has anybody heard of, you know, like, there is there a farm school that I can go to kind of thing? Right. That's, you know, I mean, there is now, but, you know, and they, there's some really creative and clever ways that organizations are approaching that. And they're using different models that, you know, are borrowed from perhaps tech. Like there's one here in my community where it's a larger farm and there are eight farmers on it. And there's a farmer mentor that is employed by the nonprofit. And at all of the other eight farmers, they pay a very small amount of money and they learn to farm and they build their business model and they build their customer base and they you know, stay there for a few years until they can find land on their own and have built their business enough that they can sustain their own farm. So, you know, using that model for farming is brilliant because now you have eight farmers all learning together and bouncing ideas off each other and sharing equipment and sharing ideas. And that is what is missing, right? Because if you don't grow up on the farm, you don't know the land, you don't know, you know, every year is a different, you know, a lesson. Yeah, it's on how expensive to because it can be expensive lessons, expensive. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's really interesting how these things are being approached and tackled. You know, in financing, there's a lot of microloan agencies that are, you know, kind of filling the gap there for women who have a hard time accessing traditional financing. I think you, on your podcast, you there was you had some have some interesting topics. Um, ones about farming and financing. Um, I found to be really compelling. I think it was recent. I think it was the first season. Yeah, first season. In, first season. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just you know when you go on iTunes, sometimes it doesn't go in order. Right. For me, it just it, it just goes like so. Yes, yeah, so that was yeah. That. I mean, so. we explore different ways to finance your farm, and then different business models on farms. You know, different ways to approach and change the business of farming. There's some really, you know, I keep saying creative and clever because it's true. You know, there's one woman who decided that she was going to do yoga on her farm and the goats climbed all over the people while they were doing yoga and boom, she had an idea. And so she has marketed and sold the concept and her business model and as a franchise. Yeah, that was that's an amazing yoga. episode. That was a great one too. But because what it does, I think, Audra also, is it just expands the possibilities in people's minds. Like, oh shit, like um, there's another one that you had, like you can Airbnb, you can, you know, goat yoga. I mean, it just opens up one's mind for possibilities how to maximize and utilize the land. 
Yeah, it doesn't have to be just about growing and harvesting and selling. Right. You know, you actually, you know, create... I, I, I think what women do really exceptionally well is build community. And the way women are farming is building community. Like example-wise, like building community because sharing or... Well, they direct market, okay. you know, so they're at the farmer's market. So they're the ones there or they'll direct market to restaurants mm-hmm. or they'll direct market to small co-op grocery stores. Mm-hmm. You know, and they often are the ones who show up at the back door with the box full of vegetables. Right. You know, so they're they're building that community versus, you know, putting it on a truck and, you know, buy, you know selling it into a larger, you know chain. They're also the ones who are doing the Airbnb or hosting workshops on the farm to learn how to, you know, whether it's learning how to can your vegetables or dyeing wool or any of those things that, you know, that craft that's sort of kind of coming back and has a new life. Then there's, you know, the goat yoga. There's all kinds of really cool business models out there of women who, you know, saw a problem and solved it creatively. Some of the women that have these farms, I think you were mentioning a lot of them have left their corporate jobs to farm, or like you said, it's their encore, but they've brought a lot of the business mind to the farms. You know, it's interesting. I I feel like a lot of the women that I meet, the young women who are farming now, they really weren't socialized in this idea of farm life. Right now, Americans are about three generations removed from agriculture. Wow, so, yeah. you know, it's really like our great grandparents who were the last of the farmers for most of us. So it used to be 50% of our nation was involved in agriculture in some way. And now that sits around 1%. So, you know, that's a huge gap that sits between producers and consumers. No, but it was, about, it was really about bringing the corporate, how a lot of people, women right. have been leaving their corporate and bringing that business. Right. So they're not socialized in that idea of, you know, farm wife, they are socialized in that women can be anything. That's what we, you know, told our daughters, right. you know, yeah. that's what we were told. We can be anything. And so that's what they're doing. And they bring these business ideas and models with them. You know, I have met so many attorneys and PhDs and uh, women who worked in, you know, c- civil government and, you know, all really interesting backgrounds and yet they're all here on the farm and what was that draw and you know I am forever asking that question because I was just going to ask you that what is the common thread that that you find that is their why (laughs) (laughs) I mean I think for so many women it's a fierce independence that desire to be really truly independent and to build community and to feed people. For some people, there's a real desire that to feed people, to feed their communities. Do you find that as you've been chronicling and documenting and journeying with a lot of these women on their stories, do you find the desire to have your own type of farm or something like that? Or is it more interesting documenting the journey for you. Do you know what I mean? Like, is it... I know my mom says, are you going to be a farmer? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <laughs> mom, I'm too lazy to be a farmer. It's a lot of work. <laughs> you're, I don't think you're lazy. You're like me. You have so many things going on. You have, you have tons of energy, but it, it might be obviously more satisfying and passionate for you to direct it in ways to showcase these. I mean, you know, I, I'm doing something I didn't know I could do five years ago. And... You know, in photography, you know, like you said, it's just one piece of it. You know, it's just one tool in my toolbox to tell these stories and to help build the platform for the stories. Okay, during lambing season and kidding season, when I see the baby goats and the baby lambs, I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I do want to be a goat farmer. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but yeah, for them. Yeah. 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 But that sign, you know, no thanks. It is yeah, a lot of work. I mean, it, I'd say bravo and vacations, right? Yeah. I mean, those animals have to be fed and milked every day. Yeah, There's no vacations. No, I mean, not that I ever take a vacation, right. but but the um, idea of taking one is definitely <laughs> out of the realm of possibility when you have to take care of the farm all the time, right? right? Yeah, right. And that you know that brings a lot of stress to a lot of people, and it can be really hard. But no, I'm not going to be a farmer. I I feel like what I'm doing is affecting change. And I 
I'm really proud of the change that we have affected. Hello, passionate restaurant owners and managers. I have some very exciting news for you all. Touch Bistro iPad POS. They want to make your life easier. Easier. Doesn't that sound lovely? Music to the ears. So they are an iPad POS company and they want to talk to you about making your business better. For Touch Bistro, they get restaurants. I love this company. When I was running restaurants, I wished my POS could help me be even more of a superstar than I was. (laughs) Seriously, Touch Bistro helps you do exactly that by giving you super detailed sales reports so you can tweak your menu on the fly. Or when your servers are taking orders, they can just take the iPad to the table and voila, the order goes straight from the table to the kitchen and bar. So no more mistakes. It's true. Now, Touch Bistro is not just for full service restaurants, food trucks, cafes, Fast casual, Touch Bistro is definitely your solution. And did you know they are used in more than 10,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries? So tons of people like them, not just me. I just do really love them. Touch Bistro, they're great. So I have a great deal for you all. If you go to touchbistro.com forward slash just forking around, that's touchbistro.com forward slash slash just forking around. Enter in my promo code. It's Debbie20, D E B I 20, and you will get 20% discounted when you sign up. 20%. That's huge. So just go to touchbistro.com forward slash just forking around and enter in promo code Debbie20, D E B I 20. Enjoy. We're leading up to the actual doc, right? The documentary, but. Yes. Up, up- yeah, because that's important. We, I definitely want to get to that. But there was a couple of uh, along the way, there's been some interesting pivots that you've been a part of. When I mean a pivot, like you start down this one road and then some things have expanded or really kind of sparked your interest. And one of them was the suicide of farmers, which was mm-hmm. something that you were part of to help kind of bring that to light. And that was something you're passionate about. And then there were some other paths along the way. A couple years ago, um, a woman called me to write. She was writing a story about um, pants, women's pants, really the the lack of women's workwear for you know people who are in trade and for women who are farming. You know, where are those pants that fit? Right, they That's just didn't, you know, like yeah. And it was so funny. So she called to get my you know kind of take on what I've seen on the farms, and you know. It's like there's just really nothing out there. Like you, there's nothing out there where you, you know, squat or bend over that you know you don't give everyone a show. Oh my god, you know, it's totally true, right? So it was, you know, and we ended up talking on the phone for a couple of hours. And she lives in Arizona, and I asked her if she knew that Arizona had the most female-owned oh, yeah. and operated operations in the country oh, yeah. by far, Arizona. I know, Who it's knew? Crazy. It's not even the water situation there too. I know. It's dry. And, you know, so we, I said, I would love to come to Arizona and unpack that statistic and see what it is that's behind that, what's going on there. And so I did. I flew down there and she and I traveled all over Southern Arizona for a week. We put on so many miles and we, and it was 108 oh most gosh. days. 112 one day. It was so hot. And we just went from farm to farm to farm, you know, trying to really figure that statistic out. So she and I partnered from there. We, out of that week, I think we published five pieces in various magazines and outlets. And we just decided that we, you know, this was a great partnership. You know, she's a former farmer herself. And, you know, I was trying to do the writing and the photography, and I felt like I couldn't do both well. And she was a great, phenomenal writer. So we um, partnered up and started doing pieces together. And it just works really well, even though she's in Tucson and I'm in Seattle. And one of the pieces was that she had been kind of cooking in the background for about five years. It's five years now. So it was about four years at that point was the behavioral health of farmers and the farmer suicide crisis. And we had pitched the piece over and over and over and over again for over a year and been told no by everybody. And ultimately, 
we got funding from the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, and they helped us place it with the Guardian. And oh, yeah, we, that's the Guardian, yeah, yeah. So we flew to Kansas and Nebraska, Iowa. We just got in a car for ten days. We traveled around to different farms, like we did in Arizona, oh, and yes. we wanted to unpack this this statistic. And the statistic is that. Farmers and ranchers die by suicide at a rate higher than any other occupational group, wow. including military veterans. So five times more likely than the regular population and twice as likely as military veterans. And that was a terrifying statistic. So we traveled and met with a farmer in Kansas who suffers and has thought of suicide every day for the last 10 years. And we met with several widows and with a doctor who has been working in this space since 1978. And Debbie wrote the most beautiful piece and it was published in December. And, you know, we, (laughs) I remember we were in these tiny little $30 a night Iowa hotel rooms and we thought, you know, the ultimate dream would be that policy would change and that their legislation, there would be legislation in response to this piece. And it published in December and by March 15th, so it was December 6th that it published, by March 15th, um, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed legislation into law here in Washington State, putting farmers suicide prevention, uh, you know, as a priority here in our state and funding some resources for farmers and farm workers. And it's bilingual as well. And simultaneously, we've been working with the House of Representatives, uh, different congressmen to get legislation placed there. And that dropped in March as well. And this week, actually, it hasn't been announced yet, but this week, we uh, another bill will be dropping in the Senate. Wow. Bravo. So really, That's really amazing. Yeah. So, and you're talking about Debbie Weingarten. Is that yes, yes yeah, from Debbie she, Yeah, yeah. Tucson based uh, writer and yes. ed- editor. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Should have said her name. <laughs> <in> her <house>. <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing. I, I know that you were working really hard on that and really that was something that was really um, close to your heart, as all these projects are that you, that you seem to pursue. But that was a real big one, I know. And that was really a huge mark. It really does. I mean, it's, it sits at the intersection of agriculture. You know, it's not necessarily a, a, a woman based problem. It's an agricultural based problem. It's a food system problem. There are a lot of problems in our food system with invisible workers. You know, like I said in the beginning that, you know, there's, you know, from the farmers to the farm workers who are, you know, in the packing sheds to the truck drivers to, you know, the dishwashers. There's just a lot of invisible people in the food system yeah. that have gone ignored and there are people in the food system and we need to center farmers in agriculture. Mm-hmm. So that's really what that piece was about. And Debbie and I are actually working on two more stories that intersect with agriculture as well. Nice. And, you know, they, you know, they're not easy stories to tell, but we want to tell the hard stories so that change is made. When we talk about the why maybe of female farmer project and documenting, it's it's for for change, it's for exposure, it's for understanding, it's for reminding, I mean, are all those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're leading into the film here. The film really, when I look back, was always the goal. Because when I started doing that research five years ago, and I looked in the library and I couldn't find women. So I did something about it. I put the modern day story back on track, right? Now people are talking about female farmers and There are conferences just for women farmers and there are, you know, like things are happening and, you know, have risen up to the level that I'm starting to feel like, wow, like, you know, wow, that's great. Like I, women are now being paid attention to, but how did we get here? How did we get to this place where women are struggling to access this stuff? What happened why are we dealing with these consequences? And those con- and those consequences come from the fact that we didn't pay attention to women to begin with. Mm. Not only were they missing from this, you know, from all the books and all the research and the archives and even Google searches, not you know, that is a problem in itself. But also, the government didn't even count women in the farm census. Women farmers, they didn't even count mm. them until the 1978 farm census. So for many of us, that's in our lifetime, that women weren't even 
counted. Wow. So, of course, there's problems. When women aren't counted, when women, you know, any group of people are not counted or seen, then how is anything designed with them in mind? Mm. So, you know, we can look at these policies and say, look, they weren't designed with women in mind because women weren't on the list. Right. No, that makes complete sense. <laughs> what you just said, it's like, hello, right? <laughs> they weren't even in the data. Yeah. So we only have data for women farmers for the last 40 years. And really, you know, in the last four years, it's changed quite a bit. How, you know, women coming into farming and how they farm and all these first generation farmers coming in and how they're accessing, it's it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, just in the past four years, you said, was that... Right, right, just in yeah. the past so, few so years, this, in urban farm in urban farming too, it's just the whole guess what right. system of farming has changed, and there's definitely a lot of women in the forefront. When I Google Santa Monica or Los Angeles, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like you know, these female farmers are doing some urban farming and selling herbs and things to different restaurants. I wouldn't have known that. There, I did a podcast with the director of the census before I think it was last fall, and talked to her about you know what the census was going to do different this year because they do it in year two years and eight years. So 2018, they did it this year. And, you know, we talked for about 45 minutes about what was different. So and that's actually worthwhile for anyone, even if you're not necessarily interested in agriculture. It's a really interesting podcast in that understanding how a group of people weren't counted So that's what the film objective is. The film is to go back and look at the history of women throughout history and what they did for agriculture, because they certainly did quite a bit, didn't get credit for it. They invented things, you know, they created, you know, there was a woman here on the Olympic Peninsula who used to play her gramophone for her cows. And so she got more milk than, you know, the other dairy farmers, you know, little things like that. that (laughs) That's awesome. No, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) But it's interesting to, you know, like, really look back at these women who were kind of at the forefront of some interesting ideas. And, but then also relate that to the modern day story. You know, who are the women who inherited these legacies? And, you know, the good and the bad. Yeah. And figuring that out. We're in fundraising mode right now. We've been developing the concept for a while doing a lot of research. We have um, a part to everybody who's working on it has been working on it up until this point, you know, as volunteers. But now we're getting to the point where we need to start funding it so we can actually start getting this film made because it needs to be made. It definitely need needs to, to be made. Yeah. But before we get to that part about the film, I, I love everything you're doing. I'm a huge uh, supporter. Indiegogo supported you on that for sure because I really want this to get funded. So I'm going to do my best to help spread the word because I, I, I have a passion for this project. That's, I think, how we met. But I'm curious as to, so far, what some of the different farmers that you've met with and interviewed, is there a... I just, I'm so curious about like common threads amongst any of them or, mm-hmm. you know, like is there certain rituals or mantras that you find to be common or, you know, do you have... A, and also maybe a favorite or most powerful couple women that come to mind. I know it's probably hard to choose. (laughs) (laughs) It's like choosing from one of your children. (laughs) Yeah, I know, okay. (laughs) Or maybe a more recent one that has stuck with you. Maybe that would be. Yeah, well, I really love, I think I've, you know, hinted at it before of how creative women are at problem solving. There's one farmer who was here in my town. She wanted to raise sheep. Oh, she really wanted to raise sheep. Loved her baby lambs. She loved her sheep. You know, she loved doing the fiber thing. She um, also did meat and she loved it. But the piece of land that she was farming was not conducive to the kind of grazing that those sheep needed. You know, she was in forested land and she couldn't grow grass. You know, and these these sheep needed to be on pasture. And so, you know, her husband suggested that they, you know, take down more trees so that they would get more light and then they could grow grass. And she thought about it for a very long time. And then she made the really hard decision that she was going to have to send these 
sheep to a farmer that had pasture and that she was going to have to farm something different that was more adaptable to the land that she was farming. And so she now raises pigs. She's a hog farmer. Oh my gosh. I think... <laughs> I think I've read that story or somewhere or something because that's interesting. Or maybe I don't know. I just this is hey, yeah, yeah. She I, has a beautiful essay up on my website. Yeah, I think about that's read, how mothering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how mother how mothering the farm the the sheep and the lambs t- taught her to be a better mother. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a really beautiful essay. She's a beautiful writer, and I thought that was that was really interesting, and and I felt that was interesting in ways that are different from other people and that she listened to the land. Yeah, true. And that's the common thread that women tend to connect into nature and work within nature's systems versus dominating nature's systems. You know, if something can't be grown here, then we'll chop it down and we'll make it grow here. You know, you can look all the way back into the early naturalist writings of, you know, these nature writers, you know, the men, you know, their writings were about conquering, like I conquered this. And the women writers were more about connecting into the systems and listening to the land. And that's what I see when I visit those farmers is I see them observing, spending time with their farmer, with their animals. They know when their animals are sicker before before anything else, you know, like they can tell when something is different with the herd. They can tell when something's different with an animal because they spend time like really connecting with the land and with their critters. That is beautiful. That's a, that's the way to to farm really, right? Or to grow anything or to be, right. to kind of go with the nature instead of like, we're just going to clear the shit out and we're going to grow something, <laughs> you know, even though the yeah. sun's not right and it's shadowy, you know, or something. Right. Or, you know, it's, you know, desert land. So we're going to, you know, you know, Arizona is a lot of, you know, growing things where things shouldn't be grown. Right. You know, it's a lot of irrigation. But then when you look at the native farmers, they farm, they do dry land farming. A lot of their seeds are desert adapted and they will plant them right before the big monsoon season. So there's one rain, you know, one big rain and then they don't irrigate. The the stuff grows on the one rain. You know, they have 60 day corn, they have, you know, tepary beans, they have all these things that have, are meant to grow in the desert. Right. And then the seeds have been those seeds were carried onward instead of yeah instead of the seeds I mean, trying trying to change the seeds to grow anywhere <laughs> right right I mean that's I think that's really at the root of what I see women doing in agriculture cool. is listening so I want to get into the the project and how we can support you in this huge important project. You know, it's it's so funny because, you know, I, like I said, I was at Microsoft and then, you know, I was a mom and, you know, I, I don't, even though I came from Los Angeles, you know, I don't come from the film industry. So this is a new sort of wheelhouse for me, but you won't meet anybody more determined than me mm-hmm. to get these stories told. Mm-hmm. And this film has to be the next step because we have to understand our history. We just have to, because if we don't, then we don't know the mistakes that we're making now. And when you leave voices out of the conversation, you don't know what lessons you have are going, un, you know, I don't know what lessons I haven't learned if I don't, haven't heard everybody's voice. So it's really important to get women's voices back into this conversation. And within that spectrum of women's voices, it's incredible the diversity you know, we're talking about native farmers. We're talking about African women who, you know, were stolen and sold as slaves. We're talking, you know, they, you know, those women, you know, they didn't know what their future held or even if they were going to be part of the future, but they tucked seeds into their hair because they knew wherever they were going, they were going to have to feed their family and community. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, it's just, you know, like that, just that little bit of information. You know, yeah. you can kind of I mean, these are things that lost, you know, the translation. Yeah, the they time. get lost. And even with, you know, the colonization where the women came in and traveled across the country, they 
sewed seeds into the hems of their dresses. Again, not knowing if they were going to be part of that future, but knowing that once they got there, they would have to feed their family and communities. And that's the common thread through this is that in these times of crisis, it was women who were thinking about the future and the food. You know, they were the seed savers and collectors and carriers. And then you look at, you know, the world wars. There's the women who marched into factories. They wore uniforms, you know, Rosie the Riveter, you know, they had cute posters and everything. And they kept America humming. They worked in those factories. But what we don't know about is the U.S. Crop Corps or the American Land Army, where women also had uniforms and they were recruited. A lot of them recruited straight out of university. And they went and worked on farms and they kept America fed during times of war. And we don't talk about those women. And then, you know, in the in the 70s, there was the Landyke movement. And then there's the farm crisis in the 80s. And over and over again, we turn to women to help us get through the crisis. But there's just, they're completely missing from the narrative. Wow. And I just want them to, you know, have that moment. I love it. Yeah, it's, we have had nearly 500 women nominate other farmers, you know, grandmothers, great grandmothers, etc., to be in the film. So we are, you know, we we had been doing a lot of secondary research, you know, other people's books, libraries, uh, historical uh, societies, you know, in different regions, trying to track down stories of women that were known for perhaps something else, but also happened to be a farmer. You know, the, it's one of those things where, you know, Farmer was never the thing that they were known for. But then, you know, you find that, you know, this interesting character and, oh my gosh, you know, she was the first dairy farmer in her region. She grew vegetables for the community or, you know, it just happens, you know, like she owned the grocery store, but she was also the local farmer. Yeah, there's, you know, stories. (laughs) I think our mutual friend, Nicole Jolly, she was talking about something like her great grandmother or something, like something about... I'm not, I'm not going to get it absolutely right, but something about blueberries in New Jersey. It was like there was a certain right. varietal of these certain blueberries that was like literally traced back to like her great grandmother or great great grandmother. And that that was it, the reason of these blueberries there growing wild, was her bringing them Right. Over. It was a woman who domesticated mm-hmm. the blueberry. Yes. Like, they were wild before and they couldn't be domesticated. And she figured it out. Um, I think it was a soil thing, an alkaline thing. I can't remember. She was. She was a scientist or botanist. I'm not sure if what her discipline was, but she figured out how to domesticate the blueberry. And, you know, that you, I see these stories over and over again. It's like, you know, <laughs> it was a woman who did it. You know, I think yeah. it was a woman who invented the modern day vacuum milking device. I'm kind of fuzzy on the details. I haven't looked at the story in a while, but I think that she didn't get, that somebody else applied for the patent. So she never got credit for it. You know, it's like those kinds of stories, you know, oftentimes women, if they were not U.S. citizens, if they were new to the country, they couldn't apply for patents. All right. So that's a whole, you know, and really a lot of this is, is the immigrant story. You know, it was the immigrants over and over again. You know, there was the, the women who were in, interned in the internment camps who, you know, grew gardens to keep people fed over and over and over again in times of crisis, women kept America fed. Wow. Yeah. So we're excited. We get a chron we gotta get this documentary out there so that <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I'm like, so yeah. So how so right now tell us where you're at now because what I'm I know that you have a campaign going on that I will get this podcast episode out before it ends. Thank you. And and your yes. oh, I know it's not gonna quote end, but <laughs> the um, the bookend that you have on the platform has a right start yes, exactly yes but I know it never yeah. ends <laughs> <laughs> so when I wrote my business plan a couple of years ago I wanted a portion of this to be funded with grassroots support because I wanted everybody to have the opportunity to have a little bit of ownership in this and that was important to me and so we decided to do it this spring we launched it on International Women's Day. March 8th, and it ends on the 5th of May. And our goal is to raise enough money that we can get more footage filmed so that we can take it to the bigger funders, the larger funders, the sponsors, 
who can help us finish it. The fortunate thing is we already have distribution. I think I kind of work backwards on that. <laughs> like I have distribution already. Yes. I just need the funding to right. make the film now. <laughs> right. We have regional distribution and several other you know, um, networks that have expressed interest. And um, we are working also with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to look at uh, national broadcasting opportunities. Nice. So that is, you know, amazing to me. Like, yeah. wow, we already, you know, the people believe in this film before it's been made. And it's going to get made, but that will depend on how quickly we can get fundraising done. And right now we are in the Indiegogo process, which is brutal. Yeah. <laughs> as hard as anybody has told you it is, yeah. it's harder than that. And we have been working and we're going to retool it and see what we can do, you know, offer some new things to get it kind of rebooted. We've had an organization step up to do some matching gifts, which is great. And we're excited to have this part of it because I really do want a lot of people to have ownership of this. You know, farmers just don't have a lot of money per se. Right. You know? They are struggling. It's, you know, the, the median income is down another fourteen hundred dollars this year. Wow. Can, you know, the yeah. the then it was thirteen hundred dollars last year. You know, we're in year three of a farm crisis. Wow. And That's um crazy. It's just crazy I think because our food, you know, I mean it's our food. <laughs> And the farmers. Yeah. So it's the food and the people. I mean, there's two parts, you know, to this, the crisis. There's the food, but then there's our people. Right. Centering those people. So, you know, I I can't expect them to fully fund this, but I did want them to give them the opportunity to support it in any way that they felt they could. And and then, yeah, I'm going to take this footage to the big funders and and get the rest of that money. So the, the what we're doing at the Indiegogo... And mm-hmm. we'll have links for everybody to be able to just click on it because it will, because the campaign never, it never ends, but this platform, the, like the book ends, right. it is completed. It's, it's time in May, in May right. 5th. So Indiegogo, I like the idea because I feel part of, you know, anybody that donates or shares any type of dollars on Indiegogo, it means we've, be, we support it. Like you said, it's community driven and I love that aspect of it. And I think that it really shows, showcases the opportunity for people to really become involved if they want to be involved, but don't know how. Right. And every dollar matters. I mean, I think that's what people don't understand is that, you know, it, every dollar matters, every share matters, you know, um, everything's driven these days by, you know, how many shares and how many clicks you get. And that's the same true, you know, it's true for Indiegogo as well. Definitely. And then you have a hashtag too. Yes, this is women's work. Yeah, so hashtag this is women's work. Yes, we um, are going to be putting up tanks that say this is women's work. Just a statement tank for the summer. And they're very cool. And, you know, it's not just for, you know, women farmers. Women's work is also, you know, in the kitchens and in... Yeah, true. (laughs) Everywhere, everywhere. you know. I love it. Okay, Audra, thank you. Thank you so much. I am so excited to continue to watch your progress and have you back on when this thing is taken off. You have to promise me that you'll come back, even though you're going to be like... Of course I will. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll come to Santa Monica and sit on the boat with you. Oh, please. And we can drink rosé (laughs) together. That'd be awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Audra. Thank you, Debbie. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones, please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is just forkingaround.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around Podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.